uh, let's get started. Uh, my name is Gabi Zuniga, uh, and I'm CTO of Voice Layer. So let's, let's go over uh, the outline. Uh, first, we're going to talk, uh, you know, why do we care about uh, partition-tolerant available systems? Uh, basically, what is the motivation? Next, we're going to review the CAP theorem and characterize AP systems. Uh, we're going to explore concepts behind systems like Amazon Dynamo and React. Uh, you know, then we're going to discuss how we leverage Phoenix Tracker at Voice Layer to meet our, our own needs. And finally, we're going to build uh, an AP application. So if you came, came here for the code, you have to finish, you know, wait till the end. So just last month, uh, you know, there were a, a few, uh, few pa uh, instances in which, like, for example, in, uh, in a Delta Airlines, you know, the computer system failed and they grounded over like 1,000 flights. Just a few weeks earlier, Southwest, they have like a, a you know, faulty switch that caused them, uh, you know, took their system down and took them days to, to uh, get the system operational again, and they lost, lost over tens of millions of dollars. And a year ago, United Airlines have a similar problem with a you know, faulty router, and they also affect tons of flights. So you may be wondering, what's going on here? I mean, haven't these guys heard about like redundancy and, uh, you know, and fault tolerance? So obviously they do, and they have plenty of redundancy. So let, let's look at the facts. First, like, you know, airline computer systems are you know, always on. They are, you know, highly distributed. Their systems are very complex. They integrate a lot of vendors and technologies. And you may have noticed on the previous slide that a lot of these failures were caused by networking problems, right? So apparently, I mean, when this fails and the system is consistent, it's kind of hard to recover from it. So let's go over uh, the CAP theorem. So the CAP, CAP theorem uh, deals with three uh, concepts, consistency, availability, and partition tolerance. And it pretty much states that, you know, you cannot meet these three guarantees simultaneously. So consistency means that all the nodes need to have the same view uh, of the state at the same time. Availability, uh, for every request, there's always going to be uh, a response. And obviously, that response cannot be, you know, we're not available now, you know, try later. Uh, partition tolerance means the system will continue to operate despite uh, partitioning and network failures. So if you cannot meet the three guarantees, you need to pick two, at, least, uh, at most two, and uh, you know, that's when it gets tricky. And you know, not every two combinations make sense, uh, and that's a little bit of controversy. Uh, and so for example, let's say you have like a partition tolerant, uh, a, a system that is not partition tolerant, and you are going through a partition, like a network failure, then uh, certainly you cannot be available at the same time. Uh, so you are pretty much kind of reduced to be only consistent. Uh, so, but this is not, you know, it's, it's not like black or white, so it probably will make more sense to say that you are consistent and available as long as you are, you don't, you are in, a, uh, in a network failure or partition. And probably most of the relational database fall in that category, like MySQL, Postgres. So now let's talk about AP systems. Um, so AP systems are systems that are available and partition tolerant at the expense of consistency. Uh, so, you know, these systems cannot ignore consistency. I mean, all to the contrary. They manage consistency actively all the time. And what it means is that, you know, they all the time need to be looking for inconsistent state and then try to recover from it. And these systems are times, sometimes called eventually consistent systems. So we should really embrace partition tolerance. I mean, have we, we have seen that uh, you know, network failures, they do happen indeed, and like in the case of the airline industry. And, uh, you, know, it, you know, for a system that it's consistent, then sometimes it's difficult to recover from these failures. It can take, you know, even days to recover from that. I mean, it's not clear in that in those cases if that was because, you know, database corruption or just bringing up a complex system like that, when it fails, it, it, you know, it just takes a long time. But nevertheless, I mean, we should strive to make these individual subsystems 
partition tolerance whenever it's possible, and that will increase the robustness of the whole system. So let's now discuss about uh, you know, Amazon Dynamo. So you know, in 2007, Amazon published a paper describing the design of a key value store system with high availability at a massive scale. And we're talking about thousands of nodes that can keep operating in, in, in the presence of like failures, hardware, software, like you know, network going down, you name it. Uh, so this paper led to the implementation of a new gender of database systems, like React and Cassandra. Uh, so what Amazon had in mind, uh, you know, one of the applications had in mind for this system was to uh, 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 use it for their shopping cart system. Now you can imagine that for Amazon, uh, it's really important that you know, every customer, whenever they wanna add something to their uh, shopping cart, you know, that will never fail no matter what. And for one thing, you know, the you know, customer may get annoyed, but you know, worse than they may decide not to you know, purchase the item altogether. So you know, Dynamo sacrificed cons consistency at the expense of uh, you know, certain failure scenarios. And the way that they handled that in the case, for example, of the uh, shopping cart system is that you know, if you have like two shopping carts that they disagree, then they will just merge the two and they will keep every item. And you know, that, may, that may cause that the items that you may have deleted, they may show up again, and obviously they don't care about that. You may end up buying more stuff. <laughs> so these are the techniques used by uh, Dynamo, and, and they're pretty, pretty important. We, we're gonna really dig into these techniques. Uh, we're gonna you know, spend a you know, little time uh, on all the, you know, discussing the details. So the first one is partitioning. Uh, so, you know, partition basically deals with distributing the load or the data among multiple nodes. And so we can address data using keys. Uh, in this case, the keys are hashed and they are mapped into a hash ring. And each, uh, you know, little section here is a partition. So the whole ring is divided into equally sized partitions. And a partition is assigned into a virtual node, which is called, v, uh, which is a V node for short. And all these V nodes are uh, distributed among all the nodes in the system. So here we can see that each color is a different partition, uh, each uh, uh, section, but you know, the ones with the same color, they, are, they belong to the same node. Uh, and like, even though it looks like pretty uh, uh, organized, I mean, it could be you know, random. I mean, just like, you know, to make it uh, uh, you know, simpler to, uh, in, in the picture simpler. So uh, this is called consistent hashing. And uh, this is consistent because uh, let's say that you know, a node goes down, let, let's say like the green node goes down, and all the partitions suddenly, uh, you know, you know, they are not handled, then the way this is handled is that uh, all those partitions are distributed uh, and, uh, like, uh, by, uh, through to other, to other nodes, right? And what is important here is that all the other partitions and nodes will be unaffected. And this, this differs from a, you know, other like simpler techniques, let's say, where you just hash and then do a modulo of the number of nodes because uh, you know, in that situation, if like, you get a new node or, an, or another node goes away, then all the hashes really you know, get redistributed and it affects everything. So obviously that's not a good thing. So another concept is, uh, uh, that we know is replication. So in this case, let's say that if, if we handle a value or key only on a single partition, then if that partition goes down, then uh, you know, we will lose the data. So obviously that's not good. Um, and uh, you know, in this case, if we have, let's say, we have like a replication of n equals three, that means that we need to choose three different partitions in order to store that data. And uh, you know, we want these partitions to be in different nodes. So in this case, there will be different colors. So if they, you know, you have like a, two partitions that belong to the same node, you keep going clockwise in the ring and choose a, a different node. And this is what is called a preference list. And we're gonna just, you know, use this concept later. Another uh, important concept is uh, data versioning. Uh, so, you know, data version is used in order to identify inconsistency. So let's say that, uh, you know, if each time we write, then we create a new immutable version of the data and uh, we associate a vector clock with it. So this is, this is kind of similar to Git. Uh, so everybody here is familiar with uh, uh, distributed version control. And 
uh, you know, basically what happens here is that, you know, let's say that you have two nodes that, you know, they have different inconsistent data and, you know, they, you know, they gave the data to you, sent the data to you, and now you need to figure out how to reconcile that data, right? Uh, so in this case, there are two cases. The first case is like syntactic reconciliation, which is similar in Git when you do a merge and, you know, everything went fine, everything got merged and everybody's happy. The second case is called semantic reconciliation in which, let's, in the case of Git, you, um, uh, you know, merge two things and you have errors. And in that case, Git actually cannot fix it for you. You need to go and fix your, your errors and, you know, the, your conflicts. So in this case, the application is responsible for uh, resolving those conflicts. And, you know, you can choose different approaches. Next concept is called anti-entropy. And uh, uh, basically, you know, entropy in, in, in general is like the level of disorder of the universe. In the context here is, you know, the level of inconsistency of your system. So anti-entropy means here that you, you want to, uh, you, you want to remove the inconsistency from your system by you know, mer you know, uh, uh, synchronizing all your replicas and making sure that all uh, agree and, and carry the, same, you know, the latest version. So Dynamo used Merkle trees in order to efficiently compare replicas. Again, this is similar to Git. Let's say when you compare two trees uh, in Git, you don't just go to, you know, through all the possible uh, uh, you know, context of the, of the uh, directories. Instead of that, each subdirectory has a hash of their contents, uh, you know, and you, know, you kind of collect everything to the root. So at the end of the day, all you do, you do is complete, uh, uh, compare the, the hashes of the two roots, and if they don't match, you know that the trees are different, and you can just go down and figure out what are the difference. So you can use that technique in order to figure out when two replicas differ and be able to merge them uh, efficiently. Next concept is uh, called quorum. Let's say that you are, uh, you know, we need to store a value into our, uh, into our uh, uh, you know, replicas. So, you, you know, you send, you, you send your request and then, now the question is how many responses you need to get back in order to, uh, you know, maybe be able to claim that you succeed with the operation. So, you know, those are R and W for read and write, and those are values of how many uh, responses you need to wait for. And this is kind of like an important concept because, you know, R and W are nodes that you can tweak in order to uh, trade off between uh, availability and the level of consistency. So let's say, for, uh, for example, that R and, uh, or W are one. That means that you only be waiting for a single uh, response. Uh, that obviously your system is going to be very available because, you know, all the time you will come up with a, with, with a response. But, you know, your system will going to grow in consistency really fast. On the other hand, if you make, you make R and W equal to N, then what happens is that you, you need to wait for all the nodes in the preference list to give you a response before you can uh, claim success. And, uh, you know, if one of those nodes go down, then, you know, you, you know basically you are unavailable. Uh, so you'll be very consistent, but you're, you know, now you, you trade off in availability. And so you can just tweak those values depending on the needs of your application. Last, uh, we have here a membership, and membership uh, basically uh, allows you to explicitly add uh, member uh, nodes to a ring. Uh, and, you know, basically the nodes in the ring are the nodes that are assigned partitions. And, uh, you know, each, each of these uh, nodes uh, have uh, the same view of the membership. And this is, like, not very dynamic because, uh, you know, all the nodes need to agree on what, who are the member of the ring before they can do any other operation. And we'll come later to this because, uh, you know, in our case, we want to be something that is a little more flexible than this. Now, in the case that a member, like a peer node, doesn't respond for a while to a heartbeat, then it's considered down. And that's different from, like, being removed from the ring. It's just kind of, like, temporary down. And, you know, the concept of uh, hinted replicas here is that if a node is temporary down, then on your preference list, you can have other nodes to cover for it. And then once you not come back up, then... Uh, you, know, there, you know, anything that, you know, got uh, collected by that hinted replica will be hand off into the original node, and then, you know, it's like he, he was never away. So, uh, Basho uh, created a product called uh, React KV for key value, and, uh, you know, React KV can be considered uh, an implementation in Erlang of the Amazon Dynamo paper. 
So granted that uh, you know the, the Dino paper is, is is not a spec, so you know they have you know plenty of room for uh, our freedom to you know implement whatever uh, whatever they want it. And in fact, they are it's it's you know React is different than Cassandra, so you know they each one took a different route and, 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 and different decisions. So at some point, uh, you know React came with additional products like uh, React Search, and lately they have uh, React TS. And so they decided to extract the core components of React, and uh, you know they wrap it into a library called React Core, uh, and now they open source it, and everybody is, is uh, uh, able now to build distributed and high available applications uh, using these techniques. So we don't have time to go uh, over like uh, how to build like an uh, application in Phoenix with React Core, but there is an excellent talk. Uh, from Elixir Conference 2016 in Europe uh, by, by Ben Tyler, and you guys can you know, go and learn uh, everything about that from that talk. So let's now discuss, uh, you know, wh what, are, what are the issues that prevent us from using React Core in our project? Uh, so, so first, you know, as I mentioned before, we want to experiment with different node membership mechanisms, and, uh, uh, you know, which were more adequate for auto scaling. Uh, then, you know, some of these mechanisms are, you know, are, are part of the framework. They're obviously baked in the framework, and, and they're hard to modify. Like any framework, you know, if you're if, if you're going to do the same things, the thing that, you know, the, the way that framework dictates, then the framework, you know, the, the framework is going to help you and save you a lot of time. But if if you want to defer and, and maybe tweak things, it's going to be hard, uh, you know, to do that. Uh, another minor issue is that uh, database aspects like Buckets uh, like leaked into the core library, and you know, obviously, they probably need to be extracted uh, so that you know the library is it's kind of more generic. Uh, that, that's minor. Uh, routing is still handling the service, uh, and there, are, there have been some discussions moving that into the client. And so, so, so right now, if you want to make a request, you don't know which node to, to make a request. So you know, basically, you, you hit one of the nodes, and the node will route that thing inside the ring. Uh, now, in our case, we wanted to have like very low latency, so uh, you know, you know, we'd rather have it in the client. And next, you know, you know React Core has been like slow to support new uh, Erlang uh, releases. They're, they're still based on Erlang uh, uh, 16, and you know, you know, reason for that is because uh, you know, Basho tweaked. Uh, they're highly invested in, in, in R16. They tweaked, the, you know. That release, you know, to squeeze every possible cycle out of it, and you know, you know, updating that for every every release every year, it, it's a major task. And they have like a, a standalone application, so that they are really not forced to go and, and, and update it. Now there is a, a fork uh, from Project FIFO that supports only R18, but that's kind of like very unlikely to be folded back into uh, into the into the React core. Uh, you know, main branch, and you know, as they start defer, you know, maintainability is it's become an issue. And last, uh, you know, there is the, the risk of not getting a prompt resolution for to potential issues. Uh, you know, I've been through like I went through like all the, the uh, open issues in the in the GitHub, and you know, there are, there are a few that are very old and probably very hard to replicate uh, or even harder to fix. You know, from my perspective, when I put a system in production, I want to make sure that. Uh, you know, if, if I encounter a problem that is a showstopper, you know, have uh, you know, have ability to to solve those problems uh, in a prompt manner, and you know, obviously that that's also a risk. I want to mitigate those risks. So let's talk uh, for a second about uh, voice layer. So voice voice layer is a, a platform as a service that uh, enables uh, uh, web and mobile application with push to talk functionality. So. Uh, you know, what that means is that you can embed a walkie-talkie into any, any app, and now you can communicate uh, in, from the context uh, of your app or any particular context on your app with other people. Uh, so voice messages are streamed uh, in real time with low latency to, you know, other listeners and possibly hundreds or even thousands of, of listeners. And, uh, you know, this is very different than, uh, well, Certainly different than voice over IP uh, because this is asynchronous communication, uh, and which is probably more similar to texting than uh, than to making a, a phone call. 
Now, we support uh, iOS, Android, and JavaScript SDKs. So let's go through the uh, high-level architecture. Now, this is obviously a, a simplified diagram, uh, but, it, but it's adequate to the, uh, describe our media cache interactions. So on the top, we have, uh, we have clients. Uh, could be iOS, Android, or web. And uh, you know, the requests are routed through the load balancer uh, into web servers powered by, by Phoenix. Uh, in, in order to stream voice messages between the clients, we use uh, a media, uh, media cache service, uh, which can route packets with, uh, with a low latency. And methods are also persistent, so that can retrieve later from the storage uh, when needed. So what are, what are media cache requirements? First and foremost, we need a high availability, be able to uh, uh, operate, uh, you know, be resilient to software, hardware, or network failures. Uh, you know, you know, then, you know, obviously, we don't, don't want to have like a single point of failure. We don't have uh, uh, voice message should never be lost. We have uh, efficient uh, utilization, which means we don't want to have like notes uh, slacking. You know, all the load should be relatively balanced. And uh, as I mentioned before, we want to handle auto scaling, which means, I mean, in the case we want to support, let's say, uh, you know, Amazon uh, auto scaling, in which like nodes can be added when there is a need for more load, uh, or it just killed, and the system should continue operating. So let's first go through uh, the single node case. Here uh, we are omitting the, uh, you know, the load balancing layer for clarity. Now, you know, the, the message cache processes uh, are processes that, uh, in, that cache and route the individual messages. Now, they interact with the web tier handlers and, and with the persist persistent storage la uh, layer. Uh, so the, the registry is responsible for tracking the message cache processes and associate them with the message IDs. Now, this, this uh, diagram only shows the, the data path uh, we have a separate signaling uh, mechanism that also is uh, uh, running with Phoenix PubSub. So let's now uh, move into the multi-node case. So we, we covered uh, partition in Dynamo, so this is kind of similar. Uh, we partition message ID space so that you know, each message, message cache handles uh, only one partition. Each node can support uh, multiple media cache. Caches. In order to support high availability, uh, we also allow each voice to be uh, each voice message to be cached in more, uh, in more than one media cache instance uh, at the same time. So, so for example, if one uh, one instance failed, we can keep con we can keep streaming, uh, you know, without a glitch. Uh, we use consistent caching to, match, uh, uh, to map the message ID to the registry processes. And all registries are added to the hash ring, and, and here they are shown as, as circles. So uh, let's say they want to get the preference list for key number one. Uh, in this case, we see that uh, you know, the orange and the yellow uh, you know, registries or uh, you know, media caches, they uh, belong to different nodes. In the case of key, uh, key two, then we have like two media caches, uh, or B nodes in a way, uh, that they belong to the same node, in which case we can keep going through the ring, and we're you know, going to grab the next one, which is uh, you know, the orange node. In order to keep all the hash rings eventually consistent, then we rely on Phoenix Tracker to sync the presence of all the registry processes. So we can see that both media uh, and web caches have their own version of the hash ring uh, that, that need to be synchronized. And, and you can see here that you know, the, you know, the registry uh, you know, components are only on the media cache and not in the, in the web node uh, you know, tier. But you know, what is cool here that you know, everywhere within the system, you have like, enough information to know where to go in a very efficient way. So you know, as I said before, we use Phoenix Tracker. And uh, Phoenix Tracker uh, is the underlying model that implements Phoenix Presence. Uh, so as, as Chris mentioned, uh, you know, Phoenix, uh, Phoenix presence can be used to track more than uh, just user presence and can be used to track processes uh, like for service discovery and much more. Uh, and you know, so here we're something do, some, doing something in that space. 
so in order to build like a Phoenix Tracker uh, application, that's pretty easy. And uh, all you need to do is use the Phoenix Tracker behavior. Then you use uh, start, uh, uh, start link and init, similar to a gen server. And you only need to implement a handle diff uh, callback in which you get notifications of anything that have changed in, you know, from the presence perspective in the system. So if like a, uh, a track presence got added or removed, then you'll get notifications so you know who left or who joined the system. So we build a library called uh, Dispatch that serves as a distributed service registry. Uh, so requests are dispatched to one or more service based on keys. So we use Phoenix Tracker to keep the service av uh, availability incrementation information in sync. Uh, keys are mapped to services using consistent hashing. Uh, we support redundancy, and this is open source in a voice layer uh, GitHub repository. And you know, basically what we did is like we wrapped you know, you know, some of the concepts that I described before from our implementation and open source that so everybody can use them. So the dispatch library, the uh, dispatch library has a module called dispatch registry, and this is not to be confused with media cache registries. Uh, you know, unfortunately they have the same name, so it may be a little confusing. So the media cache registry, they were kind of like a V node uh, in the description that I, uh, I had before. Here it's just like a resi registry of processes, and the processes themselves are, are like the V nodes. Uh, so here we have all these AP, uh, all the functions. Uh, add service, receive a type, uh, and uh, it just could be any, any uh, atom or, or, uh, or, or string. And, uh, and then the PID, which is gonna be the, you know, the process that you wanna track. And then you can add and remove that process, so the moment you remove, it's not track anymore, it's just you left the ring in a way. Uh, you can use get service based on a type in order to uh, uh, you know, get all the track services uh, on, the, uh, on the system. Find service, uh, use a key in order to be able to identify a, 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 uh, a process that will uh, you know, serve that particular key. Uh, so this, this is similar to be able to get the primary instance of the preference list. And then we have like a find multi-service in which we can provide a count and a type and a key. And you know, there you can get the whole preference list, which, which could be like uh, you know, a, a, any number of instances that you, you need. Uh, dispatch service, uh, it's, a, it's another module that allows, allows to enhance a, a gen server and make it trackable. So it's just kind of like a convenient module. Uh, so you can use uh, cast and call, so we, uh, these are similar to gen server cast and call, and what is cool about this is that, you know, you can build a gen server, and then, you know, your system, let's say, doesn't handle high availability or partition tolerance, and then converting that into a system, as, as long as, you know, you have a similar model of, of keys in order to other things, then uh, converting into, a, like, a high availability and partition tolerance system is going to be very easy. All you need to do is change the gen server cast and call into uh, dispatch service cast and call, and we provide additional functions like multicast and multicall, in which like you send the request to more than one node. Uh, you know, hopefully like all the nodes on your preference list, and then multicall you will wait for uh, all the results, and also going to be collected and handed back to you. And you have uh, also can specify the timeout in case I didn't want to wait for a long time. So now uh, we're gonna build a distributed uh, hash table uh, in order to demonstrate how to uh, you know, build an application using our dispatch library. And uh, this obviously, wanna, we, wanna, we, wanna, uh, we want it to be partition tolerant and high avail uh, available. And, and basically what distributed hash table is, it's just like a, hash, like a regular hash table, everybody's familiar with that, but you know, all the values are distributed uh, among the nodes. So you know, no single node has like a complete view of the system. And we can see how that can be tricky because, uh, you know, when you make a request, you want that to be, uh, you know, you, not, you want to be able to get all the information and to not lose information. Now, for redundancy, each key value is going to be stored in two different nodes. 
So let's go through uh, an, uh, like a demo here, and we're going to be demonstrating here is like a network, network split and a conflict uh, resolution. So we have like, uh, you know, the top we have node number one, on the bottom we have node number two, and uh, we're going to see how, you know, when we are uh, through a network split, we're able to recover from it and, uh, uh, and basically uh, resolve all our conflicts. So, so first, we launch the node number one, and then here we launch the node number two. They automatically connect. First, uh, we get all their services, and we see that this is basically the, what we have in our hash ring. There are two services, the top node and the, and the bottom node, so they both agree. Now, we're going to be setting a value. Uh, the key is foo, and the value is one, and we can see that we have like an info here that, uh, that you know, we, said, we saw that there is this being set on both nodes. Now, if, if we make a GET request, we also see that that's being called from both nodes. So now we go to node number two, uh, and uh, we're going to disconnect. So by disconnecting, we're, we're in a way uh, simulating a, par a partition. So now we're disconnected. Uh, we check and we see that uh, we indeed, uh, we don't have the other node in the, in the hash ring. And on the other side, in, in, the, in the first node, we also don't have that. So we, we basically have only one node there. Now we set a value of two on the second node. So now we have created an inconsistency. So the first node, the things are for foo, the value is one. The second node, the things are for foo, the value is two. So we have one over there. Now we're going to connect again and, uh, and make a, a get request, and we're going to resolve the, the conflict on get. So now we're connected, and we can see that there are like two nodes here. And when we get a get, I mean, this is going to go fast, but basically we, we get, and then we're going to be, uh, we pick one value. In this case, it's going to be two uh, out of the two values. And then we update one of the replicas, in this case, the one that holds one with the value of two. So now the second time we get, do a get, they're both uh, agreeing because we resolve our conflict. And, and uh, now this is obviously uh, you know, kind of like a sim simple scenario of merging, and we just pick in a, like an arbitrary value. In order to do things more complicated, uh, we certainly need to have like versioning, like we like explained before in the case of, case of uh, Dynamo. So let, let's now go over the code, and let's see how, how simple it is to build something like this. First, we need to create a mix project. Uh, and that's, uh, we know how to do that, mix new DHT. Then we need to add our dependencies. Uh, so in line uh, 20, we added like voice layer dispatch. Now we can, we also have that on hex. If you use the hex version, you need to uh, also add the hash ring uh, explicitly because uh, we haven't pushed it yet to hash and, uh, uh, you know, hex need to have like all the, all the dependencies in hex. And on line uh, 14, you need to add dispatch to the application. Uh, here, uh, this is the config, and uh, we have, uh, uh, you know, specify the PubSub name and the adapter to instantiate. In this case, it's uh, Phoenix PubSub PG2. Now, what's going to happen is that Dispatch is going to create an instance of a PubSub, uh, so we can have other instances that if you want to have, like, channels or whatnot in your application. We need to create an uh, OTP application. Uh, we start... We need to start a supervisor. This is, you know, kind of standard in an in a, uh, in a Elixir application. Next, uh, we define our supervisor. So the supervisor is going to be managing the DHT services, and this is a standard one-for-one, one, which means that uh, if, uh, if we, uh, you know, one of the, you know, if one of the services they die, they can be restarted. Now, this is, uh, you know, kind of like the meat of the, uh, of the, of the application. Here, um, you have, uh, it's pretty much like a, like a gen server, right? And we can see that you have the Starlink, init, and then handle calls, and, you know, you can have cat calls, handle info. I mean, this is pretty much like a standard 
gen server application. Uh, you see in the top that we have like used gen server, but we're also using our dispatch service. And so we're going to go line by line, uh, in a section by section, here to describe uh, how these differ from 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 a standard gen server. So first, we need to initialize, and then we see on uh, line 11 that we are calling service init, and we pass in like options. So the options are going to be the type that we, cho we chose. In this case, it's going to be DHT. We can choose any name, and you can have multiple service classes here, service types. Um, we're also uh, uh, you know, creating an uh, edge table. So what we're going to do here is we're, gonna, we're going to um, uh, take the value. You know, the, we're going to use this edge table in order to hold the, uh, the local view of the hash table. In order to set a, uh, to set a key value, then this is very similar to a, uh, a gen server. So we have our handle call, and we're going to use the, the, uh, the ETS in order to insert the values and then uh, reply the response. And you know, what, what the, the difference here is in line 21. Instead of doing a gen server call, we're doing a gen server multi-call. Multi uh, and, the, and the value is uh, uh, 2 for the count, and then DHT is the type. And then we're going to collect all the values, and they are going to, we're going to reply true only if uh, one of the values is true. In order to get the values, we're going to have, uh, we have a multi-call, similar to uh, the previous case. And we're going to do a lookup into the ETS to get the value. And you know, the difference here is that we have a res resolve conflict. In case of a conflict, we're going to uh, 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 do additional work. So this is uh, the, the code that handles the conflicts. And uh, here we took like a very simple approach, as I said before. What we're going to do here is we're going to go through all the results. So we collected all the results from the get. And uh, we're, we're going to pick the first value. And we're going to collect all the processes that don't agree with the value that we got. And later, we are going to, uh, for each of these processes that don't agree, we're going to update them. We're going to do a server call line 58 to set their value to uh, the, the value that we chose. And uh, then basically, we're going to be updating those replicas. And I said before, we can have a different techniques in order to make this more complex. Now, the last demo here is we're going to be doing handoff. And this is kind of useful for auto scaling. In the case of auto scaling, you want to be able to launch nodes and then have them automatically you know, participate in the system. Uh, and then if, you know, if let's say, the scaling want to go you know, reduce the number of nodes, it's just going to go and arbitrarily kill a node, maybe the one that is like, do, having less work. And we're going to see how this works. So here we have four different nodes, uh, node 1, node 2, node 3, node 4. And they're already like, up and connected. And what we're going to be seeing now is we're going to have like uh, we're going to set a value which is going to be in node number one and node number three. We're going to kill node number three, and then you know that that value, the value that stored node number three, is going to be moving, migrated to node number four. We're going to kill node number four. It's going to be migrated to node number two, and then we're going to basically launch those nodes again and see how the values get migrated back into the original nodes. So uh, first we do a set, and then we see that also got set here on this node. We can just do a get on another node and see that we got from these two nodes, node one and node three. Uh, then uh, we're going to go and kill node three. OK, now it's dead, and that went into node number, uh, number one. So we see that you know, this node actually uh, identified that. And then it replicated the value to another node on the preference list. Now we killed this one and went node number two. And now we're going to restart that node. It's connecting. And it, you know, the other node identifies that uh, you know, it no longer has that value. And then it pushes into node three. And then we're going to go into node number, number four. And then we're going to launch that again, and that is going to actually get still the value from node number three. And we're kind of back uh, the, same, the same way as before. So uh, last thing here, we have uh, uh, you know, what was the call in order to do this uh, handoff. 
Uh, basically, you know, it's, it's, in order to do that, we need first to uh, subscribe to, to Phoenix Tracker in order to get notifications when nodes join or left the system, uh, which is not described here. And we're going to just show here um, the join case, the, the leave case is kind of collapsed. And w in the case of a join case, what we're doing is like we go through, um, through all the values in our, uh, in our hash, and then basically we check for each value if uh, you know, we still belong to the preference list for that value. And, uh, and if we don't, uh, what happened here is that we're going to decide that, okay, we need to delete that value from our, our, uh, from our local hash, and then we need to migrate that to the new owner, right? So that's happening here on this task at sync. We are doing a uh, gen server call and migrating that to the new, uh, to the new uh, owner, and that's how it's taken care. The, you know, the leave is a little more complicated. It, it involves, we need to keep track uh, also of like, state replicas. That's why we have another ETS here. Uh, we're gonna open source this code so you guys can you know, go and play with this. And uh, that's all I have. Thank you very much. Uh, questions? Hi, uh, this is uh, actually really awesome because I wrote basically the same thing for stuff at work. Um, and now it looks like I can basically replace that with this. The only thing is, um, one of the things I had built was process handoff, not just state handoff. So if I had a process running on one node, uh, the tracker would actually restart that process on the new node based on the consistent hash. Um, is that something that you've considered maybe adding to the API or could support with the existing API? Um, it might be something very unique to my use case, but uh, it's been a handy feature to have. Uh, if I could build that either on top of this or it was part of dispatch, uh, that'd be awesome. Yeah, sure. So we're certainly going to be extending the thing. I mean, uh, I mean, for now, this is just like initial process in order to uh, put out there, and uh, hopefully this will be useful for other cases, and we can uh, you know, enhance and improve and make it like uh, you know, handle additional cases. Yeah, certainly. We should sync up after the talk and maybe like go more detail about, you know, what you have done and see how we can, you know, leverage anything that you have and that is missing here. Hey, can you send a pull request to Phoenix PubSub with the whole dispatcher so we just merge it in <laughs> and we don't have to do any of the work anymore? That's awesome. Cool, thank you. I just had a real quick question about uh, the conflict resolution when um, the, the node rejoined. Uh, what was the strategy that was actually used to determine what the correct value should be at the end? Right, so I mean, in this case, there is no correct value, I mean, because you have like you know, two things that happen at the same time. Uh, in, in the example that I show here, it's a very simple situation in which you just pick arbitrary value was the first one. But in the case of Dynamo, I mean, the address that uh, by using uh, versioning, Right, so you know you use vector clocks, which allows you to get some history of like you know whenever you make a change in one of the nodes, and uh, that node have already version information, then you you can correlate if like the two the two uh, changes they are consistent, kind of like what happened in Git. And if you have in Git something that already includes a different branch and you merge, it, it, it's smart enough in order to figure out how to merge that without any conflict. So if you want to have any mechanism that it's more complicated, certainly you need to have vector clocks and version in, in there. Right now, we, you know, for our situation, wasn't needed, but we can certainly add that. I mean, and this is just a starting point. And you know, as, as we have like more and more uh, needs, we may be adding, let's say, versioning and things like that into the framework. Anyone else? Okay, thank you. All right, thank you, guys. Yeah. <laughs>